We're very um, fortunate to have um, our guest speaker today, uh, Gary McMurray, um, title up here. Um, he's got several different titles. Um, he's from, I believe, the class of 85, right? Georgia Tech, that was a great class. That's where I'm class of 85. The president of, past president of Camp Panama was class of 85. Um, Chancellor of UC Davis was class of 85. Um, head of ATDC was class of 85, so it was a good group. But uh, Gary is big into the food processing space. He tends to be a bridge between us and UGA on poultry and other agricultural issues and robotics and oversees a number of labs. So uh, please join me in welcoming um, Gary. Today he's gonna talk to us about robotics research and perspectives. Um, so I do have a couple of different titles uh, uh, here at Georgia Tech, um, but I've been working in robotics for over, over 30 years now. And so I've kind of seen a lot of things and done a lot of different things. Um, I tell people when I first started doing robotics, um, I was a mechanical engineer by, by training. So we spent a lot of time building robots. And as my favorite story goes, you'd get a million dollar grant, you'd spend $950,000 building the robot, you'd spend 30,000 on a camera, you'd spend you know, 15,000 on a gripper, you'd spend $500 on the safety circuit. You know, and if the thing just moved, you know, and got somewhat close to the target, you high five. I mean, that's all it was about. You just get the thing to move. Nowadays, it's all about making the robot smarter. Okay, the commercial technology is pretty caught up and it's, it's really, really good. So now we're just trying to make the robot smarter. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is that topic. So first of all, GTRI. Um, I don't know how many people really know anything about GTRI, Georgia Tech Research Institute. So I threw in a couple slides there. Uh, GTRI, we are the contract research arm of Georgia Tech. So we are actually part of Georgia Tech, okay? So um, some of our numbers up there, you can see we kind of muddled along in about the $100 million range for many, many, many years. And then, um, sorry, it's so small. Somewhere around 2011, things started spiking. Um, so we're now up to 833 million last year. So you can see we're a big organization you know, big part of Georgia Tech, uh, good uh, economic impact. Majo vast, vast majority of our uh, work is with the Department of Defense. So if you look at here, the sponsors, Air Force, Army, Navy, and other DOD dominate everything. You see this little bitty piece over here is 5.6% of private industry and 1.71% other federal. So, well, that's mostly my team. So is that. So other federal includes NSF, National Science Foundation, uh, USDA, um, DOE, NASA, FDA, just a variety of other organizations. Um, all that is the non-DOD part. So I look at it as we get to do all the more of the fun stuff. Um, this is just a little bit of history of GTRI. Uh, GTRI started in 1934. Um, it was during World War II, and we were there funded to really work and support radar uh, for the Department of Defense. Uh, since then, we've grown at a variety of different things. One of the things I like to point out is 1973. That's when the Agricultural Technology Research Program started, and that's one of the big programs that's in my division. So that is what funds a lot of the agricultural work that you see and hear about today. So it's been really, really important. Uh, that program has now grown to over two and a half million dollars a year. So it's a pretty good size uh, program. So uh, our mission here at, at GTRI, um, a lot of times you, people, you know, could, because we are so DOD centric, a lot of people think the sole mission of GTRI is DOD and that's it. And as you can see here, you know, that's actually second on the list to serve national security. Okay, but really our you know, thing we really try to do more and more of is enhance the economic impact. So that means in the DOD world, it means supporting the military bases here in the state of Georgia. And we have a number of bases that are here, helping them bring in work, different projects, and supporting uh, all those activities. But it's also improved the human condition. It's a lot of the work that I do. Uh, and then educate future technology leaders. Uh, GTRI is the number one leader, uh, number one hiring um, company of undergraduate co-op students um, and internships. We also hire a lot of graduate students. So specifically within my team, we're about uh, 35 research faculty and about 40 students. 
So we have everything from uh, undergraduate student assistants, uh, co-op students, masters, PhD, and we even have postdocs. Okay, so uh, we really that education piece is really really important to us. So within um, so within GTRI, I am a division chief. So as I mentioned, I have about 35 people that work for me in a number of different uh, areas. But this is our mission statement and. The reason why I throw this up is because it really goes to what we focus on, okay? And in our case, we're about transforming agriculture and food systems, um, energy and water, and safety of people at work, okay? Now, part of, a lot of this might sound very disconnected and random, um, and I certainly understand that. Um, part of the, the presentation, you'll, I hope you'll understand how some of this stuff comes together. But if nothing else, I just want you to understand when it comes to food and agriculture, which is the two main areas, you know, uh, being able to produce more on the farm is very, very important. Increasing yields, uh, efficient use of water, uh, energy, and reducing the use of chemicals and pesticides, okay, are all critically important items. And so we have technology that works in a variety of those uh, different areas. So, um, you know, for us, it makes for fun work. And that's one of the things that we've always tried to focus on is trying to be, do that fun work. Um, so this is uh, just a little side of some of the uh, technologies and application areas that we work. So we have two state programs, HRP and Environmental Sustainability Program, and then IRAD, that's our internal research dollars. We put that into our five critical areas, uh, robotics, which is my area, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing mainly on this presentation. But we also do chemical and biological uh, sensors and systems. Uh, as you might expect, that also has a big DOD application areas, but it's also really big in ag and food. Uh, energy materials, machine learning and data analytics, because everybody has to have a machine learning and data analytics group these days. And then systems engineering. So those are technology areas, and then we apply it to these different application areas. And here's listed these different application areas, along with some of the funding sources. Uh, that uh, fund the work that we do, okay? So at GTRI, as I mentioned, we're the applied research arm. And what that means is um, we have one foot on the basic research side and the other side of building systems, okay? So, th and that's what is really fun. So the basic research side is why we have all the graduate students, why we work with so much uh, faculty members here at Georgia Tech and at UGA. And then we actually are building systems and deploying things into the field. So um, that makes for a lot of fun stuff. Uh, many of you might have heard about the, the big project with the Gates Foundation, Generation Two, Reinventing the Toilet. Uh, that is being led out of mechanical engineering, uh, Shannon Yee. But we at GTRI are doing the bulk of the mechanical design and building the prototypes, which are actually being shipped to South Africa and India. Uh, South Africa goes out next week, and the unit to India, I think, has already gone to our partners in Switzerland that would then be shipped over there. So we have our fingers in a lot of different um, types of projects. So now with all the intro stuff out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff. Um, robotics. Um, you know, traditionally when people think about robots, they, they think of pictures like this. You think of automotive, okay, where it's just a long manufacturing line and you've just got robot after robot. Uh, they're in cages and they're just doing one task. Okay, it's welding, it's painting, okay? And that robot will never do anything but that. Uh, one of the jokes we have about in robots and manufacturing is that the only company or person who benefits from the functionality or you know, multi-purpose functionality of the robot is the robot manufacturer, okay? Because everybody else buys the robot, sets it in, uh, bolts it to the floor, and it only does one thing for the rest of its life, okay? And that's what people uh, think about here. And then on the bottom, you see uh, another very popular thing of just picking up boxes. And that's what is you know, supply chain, okay? Um, super popular task, just you pick up boxes, put them on pallets, okay? It's the same size boxes every time going into the exact same pattern, okay, on the pallet. Or you'll see the exact opposite, they're depalletizing. But it's, again, everything is the same, okay? Everything is very tightly controlled. Okay, there's no flexibility in anything that you see. That car, as it's coming down the line, is, is mounted on a very fixed chassis. 
okay, uh, on that conveyor. So they know precisely where that car is. Okay, they have CAD model for everything. Okay, everything is very rigid, very well defined. That robot is the equivalent of you putting a blindfold on your eyes and um, putting earmuffs on. That robot can't see anything. Okay, that robot is simply moving from point A to point B. And God help you if, so, if the robot that parts not at point B. Okay, because if something goes wrong, okay, the little red light uh, will, will turn on, the line will shut down, 20 guys in suits come running out, and then all the, the technicians, and, you know, they're trying to fix the problem. Okay, no flexibility in that system whatsoever. So, but now the robots are moving outside of that environment. Okay, we're getting outside of just pure automotive manufacturing. Okay, robots are going into ag. Okay, and one of the hottest areas in uh, VC uh, world in the past five years has been ag robotics. Okay, it's also been one of the most popular areas for companies to go crash and burn in ag robotics. Ag robotics. But you see in the supply chain, you see in the house, you know, all these different environments, people want robots to go there. Okay, because that's where the problems are. And that's what we call this unstructured environment. Okay, because now you don't know where everything is ahead of time. Okay, you don't know what you're trying to pick up. Okay, but trying to get the robot to work there is really, really hard. And that's why we're adding the intelligence. Okay, how do you get the robot to be able to think and be able to pick up and do things? To the human, it's super easy. Every one of you walked into this uh, conference room, okay, you were able to find the chair, sit down at the table with no problem. And even if you've never seen this particular type of chair before, you immediately said, that's a chair. None of you said, hey, what's this funny little thing under the table? Okay, you, you know that instantly. Getting a robot to do that is still really, really hard. Okay, AI machine learning has made great progress, but still, if you don't have that chair, if you've not seen that chair before, AI machine learning is gonna have a hard time identifying that as a chair sometimes. So makes it difficult. So when we talk about um, these unstructured environments, what is it that makes it hard? Why is this such a challenge? Well, first of all, we're trying to pick it's the objects, the things we're trying to manipulate. Okay, usually there's the things that are they're wet, they're slippery, they're formable. There's no CAD model for an apple. Okay, so you can't just take an apple, compare it to the, to the model and say 99.9% .9 that's an apple. Okay, can't do it. Right now, uh, and one of the big problems in, um, in, in agricultural robotics, you go up to an apple tree, try to see all the apples. Right now, the best they can do is about 78%, okay? With a single image. They've looked at every frequency, every wavelength. Can't do it, okay? So maybe <laughs> it's just not a simple solution. The environment, you can't control the environment, okay? I cannot tell you the number of demos that I uh, have either personally failed at, or I've seen other people fail at, where they got the robot working great. Okay, works great at three o'clock in the afternoon. Unfortunately, we did a demo at eight in the morning and the sunlight was coming in differently. None of the vision worked. Okay, nothing's more embarrassing than you bring in the sponsor and have to tell them it worked great at three. It doesn't work with the sun out. So dealing with the sun, dealing with clouds, um, dealing with, you know, fog, dealing with wind, okay? Things are moving, things are not always stationary. All these things are really hard. High variability of the product, okay? Every product is different. Uh, we do a lot of work in the poultry industry, okay? Um, it's a natural, it's a, it's a, it's a live, it was a live animal. There's, n there's no similarity between the, the, each animal, okay? It's so different. And, but this is really the majority of the world. That structured environment and that manufacturing plant is the rare, it's the exception, okay? But we now think that that's, you know, that, that works. So, and the other thing I always like to tell people is the biggest fallacy about working in structured environments is YouTube, okay? And I can't tell you the number of people I know who go out there and watch the Boston Dynamics videos and go, it's done. I saw Boston Dynamics do it. They had the robot, it, the robot, it did flips. It picked everything up, it was great. Solved, problem solved, move on to the next one, okay?
talk to the guys in Boston Dynamics. A thousand takes, okay, to get it to work one time, okay? So this stuff is really hard, okay? This is not done yet. Um, and this is what, uh, what we're doing here, Georgia Tech and GTRI. I put Georgia Tech and GTRI there because we're doing it together, okay? Um, it really is a combination of uh, the faculty at Georgia Tech and at GTRI trying to do this. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try to walk through a number of different examples or uh, projects that we have done, okay? And what I want you to understand now is we go through these different projects. Look for the common theme, okay, to each one of these projects, okay, across all the projects. Look at how um, sensing is required and how you're trying to make intelligent decisions about what's going on and, and how and the environment is unstructured. Okay, and then think about what you would do if you were in that environment, okay, or faced with that task, okay? Because the human does this so easy, okay? I mean, it's just amazing. A lot of the work I've done, and we'll talk about this, is in the area of visual serving, the real-time control of robots using vision. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to simulate the same thing that a two-year-old can do with no problem, is they can pick up their toy and manipulate it. Actually, a one-year-old can do that. Okay, I'm trying to get a robot to do the equivalent of a one-year-old. That's embarrassing sometimes, <laughs> but that's kind of where we're at. So the Marines had a problem. Uh, the Marines wanted to be able to supply their, uh, their bases, okay, and their forward operating bases, and they have a variety of different depots and stuff, but they're, it's kind of that last mile for the Marines. The problem that they have is that the objects vary, okay? You know, you, you, when the things come initially to the base, they come in with a single pallet, okay? One pallet of the exact same, as a matter of fact, they can get 10 pallet, pallets of the exact same thing. But when you actually want to go send it to that forward operating base, well, they need two boxes of this, three boxes of that, and then you got ammunition that you have to handle. Ammunition is really heavy, takes two. You know, you see that at the top left, you know, these are Marines. You know, they're still taking two hands to be able to pick up everything, okay? These things are heavy. So how do you be able to, to satisfy that? You've got to stop touching that. Um, so one of the things uh, we worked on, and this is actually some work from Stephen Belichersky, who's, uh, who's here. So if you have any questions, I'll defer to him. Um, but one of the things we first looked at was building the pallets, the rainbow pallets, okay? If you, given that you know what, you know, what set of boxes you have, and, and so how do you how do you build a pallet so that the pallet is stable? Okay, so we worked on a lot of simulation work to be able to build these pallets um, in real time. And so as the parts are coming in, you know what to do, and then you can pack. Then we started working on the hardware. So we built this is the very first prototype system that we built. And this is actually building those pallets. Okay, that rainbow pallet, you know, again, you know. You have a list of what types of projects are coming. You just don't know what sequence the parts are coming. So you want to build a stable, a stable thing. We also started uh, working with some of the controls of uh, six degree of freedom arm and a seven degree of freedom arm. Seven degree of seventh degree of freedom is that rail that's moving. And one of the things we looked at this, and we said, hey, this is all really pretty cool. It's kind of a little slow. Okay, it's a little kind of awkward. You know, we, we think we can improve some of these. We want to make it faster. We really want to improve that coordination between those robotic arms. So, so this led to looking at what we call some uh, two-arm coordinated motion. And what we want to be able to do is basically do the same thing that the human does. You have two arms, okay? Not very often, I say not very often, uh, you, you don't run your arms into each other. Okay, you do a pretty good job of avoiding the arms. As a matter of fact, you can close your eyes. You can still kind of move your arms around and not hit. Okay, how do we be able to get that with robots? So the robots can work together. And you want to be able to do that in real time. Okay, a lot of the, the things you'll see in a traditional manufacturing environment is everything's pre-programmed. It's like the dance. Okay, everything's pre-planned. The dance, everything is, is done, timed out to the exact perfection so the robots never hit each other. But how do you do this in real time? So this is where we put together this demo 
of um, a robot, two robotic arms picking up a box. Looks really exciting, okay? Picking up a box, wow. But what's really cool about this is those arms are being controlled together, okay? In real time, we're doing the controls and the path planning, okay? Uh, in real time as you move, okay? This allows the robots to work together and do things that they could not do alone. And what's really interesting about this is the application that we're working on is in, is in um, palletizing, okay? Typically, when I, sh when I showed you that uh, video earlier, put that down so I don't keep not, not moving it forward. Um, typically what you do is you buy a single robotic arm that robotic arm is based upon the heaviest package you will ever see, okay? So if you think you're gonna see a 10 kilogram package, you buy a robot that can pick up 10 kilograms. Now, 95% of the time, it's only gonna see five kilograms, but you've gotta have the robot that picks up the 10 kilogram. So you've automatically got something which is over spec for the, for the process. It's gonna be a little bit slower, okay? But you have to have that safety factor. What we're looking at here now is two robots working together. And in this case, actually, that box, I believe, was a five kilogram box, okay? Each of the robots could only pick up three kilograms. So what that does is you can have two robots, okay, picking up product, okay, that are coming down a line. Each robot is faster than the bigger robot, so you're really getting two X the, the, the throughput. When you get that heavy box come, coming down, the robots can work together pick up the package, set, put it on the pallet, and then go back to working individually, okay? That gives you a lot more flexibility uh, in the system, but you have to be able to control it. And then this video. So this video is showing the, the two arms working together, but they're also all, both robotic arm drawn rails. So it's now each robot is a seven degree of freedom. So together it's a 14 degree of freedom system. Usually, with the traditional algorithms, the uh, complexity scales exponentially with degrees of freedom. But with the algorithms that we've developed, it actually scales linearly. So we can actually control these 14 degrees of freedom in real time, very easily. And what, what the student is showing right here is he's actually controlling this robotic arm with the teach pendant, and the other one is just following. Okay, and it just shows the flexibility of the system. Okay, that, you know, Given the random inputs of the person, the robot can still follow. That shows the robustness of the control algorithms and things like this. So this is you know, some really interesting uh, work that Steven and his team are doing uh, that we feel really has a lot of potential kind of in that supply chain area. So with that, I'm gonna move into poultry processing. So this is a uh, deboning operation in a poultry plant, okay? Um, this was uh, something, a task. The person does it about one every two seconds. They're standing shoulder to shoulder in a 40 degree temperature room that's wet uh, and everything. So during COVID, when you heard about people working in deep processing, this is a type of environment where the COVID was running rampant and they really had to step up the safety uh, procedures. But we don't want people doing those jobs, okay? It's really hard on, per on people ergonomically and let's face it, it's no fun, okay? Uh, the average person will do this job uh, somewhere between six and nine months. Uh, the plants have 120% turnover on that line, and it's not something, it, it takes training to be able to do this and do it well. Trust me, we've put people out there, it takes training. It's not as easy as it looks. So what we did, we, we took the approach of, we went back to, you know, thinking back to the uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who did all the, you know, you know, all those ratios in the human body, you know, you stretch out your arms, that's how tall you are. There's, there's a lot of ratios in the human body. Well, it turns out there's ratios in poultry as well, okay? So what we did was we looked at the uh, internal bone structure. So we actually have uh, CAT scans and stuff uh, from UGA and from Emory. Um, and then what we did was we matched external features to the internal structure, okay? So it turns out that there are these mathematical um, um, algorithms that can be developed to build that. So we can look at the external structure and predict where the bones and tendons are. 
In this case, what we're trying to do is a shoulder cut. Shoulder cut is basically, they always hate when you use the people as an example, but you know, it's along the, the clavicle bone, through the joint, and then down along the scapula. The reason why you do that cut is that allows you to pull off the breast meat. The breast meat is the single most valuable um, commodity item. Um, it turns out that 1% loss of breast meat correlates to about one to two million dollars annual basis per plant, okay? The average uh, poultry, this is your fun facts for today. Uh, the average poultry processing plant does about two million birds a week, and there are 21 processing plants in the state of Georgia. That's why we are called the poultry capital of the world. So if we were our own country, we would be the sixth largest producer of poultry in the world. So, so doing these cuts is really important. It's also a safety issue, food safety, because if you cut it wrong, you generate a bone chip. G bone chip gets into the food. You bite into your Chick-fil-A sandwich, um, especially small children can choke on those bones. So it is a, a truly safety issue. So we started working uh, initially with uh, uh, the simple setup, used a stereo camera to be able to look at the bird and try to identify those key points. Um, we then developed a unique cutting trajectory for every bird, okay? So it's not fixed automation, okay? Where, you, you know, you estimate the size and you say, follow this trajectory. Nope, it's customized to every bird, okay? And then we use um, force feedback. So because you, you do that cut, if you run in, unexpectedly run into the bone, you want to be able to go around the bone, not through it, okay? So, and all of this has to happen in about a quarter of a second. So, so this is um, the result of some of the work. This is in July 2020. So um, we actually went into a, a poultry processing plant. You can actually see people on the right hand side uh, working. So we use two robotic arms, one for each side, and we're actually doing the cut. With the, the, uh, the results of this, uh, first of all, we're going slightly slower than the manual one, okay? We are, since then, are in the process of upgrading the robot so we can go at line speed. But these cuts were actually able to match the, the human performance, okay? And that's really important, okay? Because one of the things we've done is we've done a lot of study about, the, about people's success in cutting. And what we've learned is, I'm sure no, nobody here is surprised, especially if you're ISYEs, when the people show up, they're focused, they do really good. But as time goes, that performance drops. And soon, you know, by you know, break, they're already losing two and 3% yield loss. Okay, they come back from break, they're doing better, quickly falls off, they go to lunch and repeats. Okay, a lot of waste. So being able to match the human and do that all day long and show up to work every day, that is important, okay? so. Um, so we actually did these tests, um, and we have all the data to back that up. It's really, really uh, good. So we're working on commercialization of this project right now. Uh, so we hope to be able to get that out into the real world soon. Um, so this is uh, some other work that we've done in the ag area. Uh, in this case, we we're trying to detect what we call abiotic stress, which is moisture and nutrient um, um, imbalance. And what they do right now is they field scout. Okay. Average, so this is a peanut crop. Average crop size in Georgia is 642 acres. Okay, really hard to do field scouting on 642 acres. Okay, so what they were doing is trying to find UAVs, uh, doing spot checks and things like this. UAVs are really, really good at finding brown spots. Okay, problem is once you have a brown spot, it's already dead. And then the question is how far is it spread? So we wanted to find things earlier than that. And then we actually have to go in and collect leaf and soil samples, because that's how you actually can to identify the source of the, uh, the problem. Um, so what we did, is, oh, this is just some examples of, of, the, uh, of the, the stress. And then this graph right here, uh, the bigger the circle is the higher the yield. And what it does, it just shows you that the, the plants that are stressed have a lower yield, okay? Uh, so what we did was um, we worked with colleagues in computer science. We developed these 
4D maps. So we build a 3D map of the plant and then look at it over time and look for variations. Turns out that the changes in the rate of growth or changes in the canopy coverage are a really good early indicator that something is going wrong. Now you don't know what the cause is, you just know something's going wrong, okay? So the computer is great at analyzing this type of data. It's like I tell people, you know, I have kids. You know, my, I'll take my kids to go see the grandparents. The grandparents are always like, wow, you've grown so much. And I'm like, yeah, I guess they have grown. You know, we've gone through three pairs of shoes and four pairs of pants. But as a human, you cannot see that growth. Okay, you just, you just can't see it. Okay, but the computer can see it. Okay, and we can catch very early um, that there's something going wrong in that area. So what we do is we use that data, generate a map, and identify the, the top stressed areas. Okay, and then we would send in, and this is just some of the data that came out of this. Um, so we build these color-coded maps. You do not show a farmer a color-coded map because they will shoot you, because they're tired of seeing color-coded maps. It has to be converted to actionable information. So we take these color-coded maps, we identify the biggest stress areas, then we send a fill, an autonomous fill robot to, to go to that, those plants, take the leaf samples and the soil samples. Okay, that could then go back to the lab to identify, you know, what's the stress? Is it lack of, you know, uh, nitrogen, magnesium, whatever it is, you can do that analysis. So the next thing we had to do was actually do the picking of the leaves. So this is a little video of the system. When you go pick the leaves, it's important. You don't, you don't just reach in and grab any leaf, okay? We're actually detecting healthy leaves and unhealthy leaves. Okay, and you have to go pick five of each type. Okay, so you don't get to pick any five that you want. You've got to go find those specific leaves. And again, sun varies. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of wind. Now, we're not operating in a hurricane, okay, but five, 10 mile per hour wind, yeah, you're going to see that. Okay, so you have to be very robust to that. So this um, robot would go in, pick the leaves, and store them. Okay, and then we'd also take a soil sample and bring that back. So that was some, uh, some interesting work that we did there. Uh, another project we're doing in um, mobile robotics is this. Let's see if I can get the video running. So this is actually uh, doing something we call peach thinning. Turns out peaches, uh, the peach tree generates thousands of blooms on the tree. Each of those blooms will turn into a peach. Problem is, you have so many blooms, the, inner, the tree only has so much energy, so what it does is generates thousands of little peaches. Okay? American consumer does not want little peaches. They want big peaches. So you have to go in and remove some of those blooms. So you have to be very strategic about which ones you remove. Again, the fun things you learn in ag. So you actually have these 3D models and you, you know, because you want the, the blooms to be a certain distance away in 3D space. Okay, that has to do with lighting. So, you know, the sun comes in, it has to do with the energy uh, uh, that you get in each limb, all these different factors. Okay, getting a person, the average field worker, to work in 3D space and be able to optimize that, no, that doesn't happen very well. They do a good job, but they could do better. So, what we did was we developed this robot, mobile robot. Uh, completely autonomous, could go out into any orchard, drive up, find the tree, okay, that's a pretty good accomplishment, find, the, find each limb, and then use these 3D metrics to be able to identify which, which ones to remove. In this case, we were a little bit late in getting to the field, so we weren't removing the balloons, we were, we were removing the uh, small little, we call them peaches, so little baby peaches, okay, so same idea though. Okay. So, and again, here's some of the image processing work. Um, this top left, um, each one of those boxes is where I found the peach hole. Okay, and I know it's kind of hard to see there. Trust me, it's hard to see this because they're all green. Okay, blends in really nice with those leaves. This is not an easy problem. Okay, image processing worked really well. Built a little custom end effector that could just cut it off and remove it. Um, so work very well. Again, it's that ability to work in that unstructured environment. Um, another area we're doing a lot of work in 
is knowledge-driven robotics. Um, the goal of this is you know, to make dumb robots flexible, agile, and able to detect er errors and, and operate. Okay, And this is exactly what the human does. Okay, When you work, if something goes wrong, you fix it. You don't, again, set the little red light out and stop and say, come, you know, come fix me. You have to make it work. So, um, so this is a ontology. So ontology is just a formal, explicit specification of, of, of the work. So we, um, we work. This is a very formal process. Okay? We're controlling the uh, defining inputs and outputs and the process. You have to be formal about this because this has to be able to work across many different domains and many different application spaces and tasks. So you want a very formal process. Uh, to be able to do this. So, um, and this is some work, oops, again, Stephen Belikursky's doing. So he's actually um, a part of a standards board, which is defining all of these, this ontology. And because we thought that's really going to set this work up to be long lasting and have that formal approach to it. Um, so what what this shows is just the basic frame. And what, what we're trying to, the point of this graph is that all actions okay, have constraints and resources, okay? And you have to define those, okay? And this is part of that formal process. But by defining everything this way, it gives you the ability to, to do so many other different types of operations and tasks, okay? And this is part of the um, IEEE Robotics um, Automation Society uh, test. So, the reason why you do this is because you want to build up what we call uh, skills. Okay, so we one of the things we want to move away from is trying to program the robot all the time. And right now, that's what a lot of the work is. Okay, you you write a very custom program. Um, okay, um, you write a custom program for that task. Okay, if that task changed. You got to rewrite the program. Okay. This is developing skills. In this video, the skill is to uh, remove a screw, okay? Remove the, the bolt and, 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 and screw. You then take these skills and you put those together into a behavior, okay? So, um, so now, this is actually doing the task of it's, re it's removing a screw. So it's a little plastic uh, piece right there. You remove the, the screw, and then you set the screw down. Then you can move the plastic piece over to another uh, setting, and then you can put the screws back in. Okay, so you can see this built on a, 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 each of those is a skill that is learned. You then put the skills together into the behavior. Okay, and if you do this correctly, you don't have to write software, okay, for every task. Okay, it's just a matter of defining the inputs. If you have a vision system, you'd say, find the screw, <laughs> okay? And then that's your input. And then the output is, did you, were you able to secure the screw? Okay, and remember that when you do this, there's a lot of fine, fine uh, motion that's involved. When you put a screw into a hole, it's not simply just drive it in and just let go. You have to put it in, you have to turn it a little bit, and you kind of have to, to search a little bit, because you know, you're not gonna be perfect the first time you put it in, okay? All of that has to be encoded in that skill, okay? So that's what this one is doing. It's now just showing you a very, very simple task of putting together a couple of different skills into a behavior. And then, this can all be put together into this. This is a demo. Um, so in this operation, you can see the, the, the robot's doing a number of different tasks. Okay, it's removing the screws, uh, the, the bolts, it then moves the box, and then it's uh, attaching, uh, plugging in um, cables. Okay, cables, there's multiple types of cables. There's coax, there's ethernet, there's USB. All of these cables are a little bit different. Okay, so each of those is a skill. Okay, and you can see how those skills are being assembled, uh, being brought together to perform a relatively complex task. Okay, all this right now is being done without vision, you know, because that really wasn't the focus of this project. 
but we're going to start adding that uh, to this. Uh, part of this work is being funded by NASA. Okay, you might ask, why is NASA interested in this? Um, with NASA, you have to space uh, space rate all of your code. Okay, and that's a very extensive process. Okay, so if something on the space station breaks that you are not expecting, okay, the last answer that NASA wants to hear is, let me write some new code. My grad students gonna write the code, we'll upload it to the space station, it's gonna work great. Okay, they don't wanna hear that. Okay, so everything has, you have to make it work with the code you have up there. Okay, so that's why they're interested in this, because if you have these different skills, okay, and you prove that they work, then NASA says, hey, that's fine. Okay, if something breaks that we were not expecting, you guys know how to, to, to plug in cords without breaking things. You know how to take things apart without breaking things. So we'll trust you to do that. Okay, so that's one example of why this type of work is so important. So, uh, but this thing will do the whole assembly process and in the end, you actually will see the, uh, the, uh, uh, the monitor flash on because the uh, Arduino board is plugged in and running. So, um, another area that we're working in is virtual reality. Um, you know, virtual reality, I mean, has, it's been around for a long time. You know, what's really interesting about that? In robotics, we're really interested in how do we move away from, you know, this manual task, okay, of, take a cutting operation, okay, or any sort of a machine loading operation. How do you move away from that into let the robot do what the robot's really good at, let the human do what the human's good at, okay? Now, all the solutions I've been showing you so far have been 100% automation, okay? You know, um, we, we, we got the human out of the loop. We're going for fully autonomous solutions. Well, it turns out fully autonomous solutions are A, really, really hard, and B, sometimes the imaging doesn't work. You can't get 100% um, or whatever. So you need the human in the loop. As I always like to, to say, no insult to my colleagues who do work in machine learning and AI, and you go to any conference, um, you know, all the AI guys will show papers, they get 80%, 90% correct, they're high-fiving. They're, they think that's wonderful. You talk to people in the industry, and they're like, 90%? You know, I mean, think about that. You have two million birds uh, a week, you know, you only do 90%. That's a lot of manual rework. You know, industry wants 99.9999%, okay? So having the human in the loop is something that would be very helpful, okay? But how do you do this in a meaningful way? VR is actually a really nice space to be able to do some of this work. So the motivation, again, is um, it's really hard for machine learning robots to be 100% in these unstructured environments. Having human there is, is actually very good. Um, and, but you wanna get people out of this environment, okay? You don't want somebody there you know, standing above the robot, because first of all, it's kind of a waste, but also you're still there, okay? It's still 40 degree temperature room, you know, that's, that's slippery, wet and, and everything. You don't want to be there, okay? So how do, we, how do we do this? VR is a really nice way of doing this. So what we have done is we have a, a camera that will sit above the workspace. It's taken a, an image of the, the product and the environment, project all that into the virtual space, where then the human can go in, okay, and work in that space. And actually, we can have a multiplayer a game, so you can actually have two people in there. So you can have a mentor or a teacher to be able to, to help somebody, instruct them what they're doing. Uh, we're just using off-the-shelf VR systems, um, and we're using using the system uh, to 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 do what the human does. In this case. Um, we are uh, doing some grasping operations. So again, this is a poultry problem, okay? Um, poultry, it's wet, it's, it's, um, it's a hard thing to be able to sometimes to define the grasping point, okay? So the human is really good at finding the grasping point, okay? So this operation right here, is that's what the human does, okay? The human just simply says, that's the grasp point, okay? Then you turn it over to the robot, because the robot's really good from going to point A to point B. Okay, the human's really good at saying, that's the grass point. The human's not good at doing that motion because the human wears out over time. 
So it's a nice mixture of the robot doing what it's good at and the, the person. And then this is just a simple video. Um, you see uh, Colin Usher, who's one of the, uh, the project director on this project, is using this, and he, he goes in, he defined the pick point, you know, right there. The robot goes over, and you know, speed is slow. But that's because that's not the, the, the function here. But uh, it'll go and pick up, and then it'll go put it on the cone. Okay. What's really cool about this is it breaks the geographic barrier or constraints as well. So no longer does the worker have to be at the plant. Okay. The average pro poultry processing and actually most manufacturing facilities are running about 90% capacity because they don't have people. Okay, and the reason why they don't have people is nobody wants to stand there eight hours a day doing that. Okay, but think about this. If you could be sitting in your, in your house or you could be a wounded vet, okay, who can't physically go to a processing plant, okay, but you can put on VR goggles and you can say, hey, look, I'll do this for four hours a day. I'm not gonna do it for eight hours, okay? But I'll do it for four hours, okay? So now you got kind of the gig economy going, okay? People could come in, pick the grass point, or even do an inspection test, okay? Parts coming down the conveyor. Just be looking at saying, hey, that part's defective. That part is defective. And the good thing about this is you're also collecting the data, which all goes to your AI, okay? So you can, then you can begin the transition where the AI could start making recommendations. Hey, I think this part's defective. Or I think this is the grass point, okay? And then, again, it's less and less workload on the human, okay? And the other thing is, you're also breaking the one robot, one person, okay? One person could be controlling multiple robots, okay? So, you know, it opens up some really nice opportunities, okay, uh, in this space. So, um, so in conclusion, so I've, I've talked for a long time. Um, you know, just want to kind of reiterate some of the main points. You know, robots are moving out of the cages. You know, we're moving out of that just traditional manufacturing, automotive manufacturing, but it's still really, really hard, okay? It's not a clearly solved problem. You know, we need the robots to be more intelligent, and that is still a very hard thing to do. We're making a lot of progress. We showed some examples, and obviously, I hate to say this, you can go to YouTube, you can see companies out there doing things, but still, it's, it's still relatively uh, difficult to be able to do these things. We've shown a couple of different solutions, the knowledge of robots, where we're trying to reuse the software so that you, can, you don't have to write programs like you used to. The code can be reused, where you get more tasks done. Sensor-driven robots, still, that's gonna be one of the big things, is how do you bring in that data? whether it's vision data, uh, color data, uh, force feedback, uh, all of these different data sources are important. And we have to figure out ways to use those better and better. And then virtual reality is a really nice environment to do some of this work, okay? Where it allows the human and the robot to work together in, a, in an environment where it actually works for both, okay? So when I, click on that, um, when I use that end effector and I click on that grass point, okay, I can get a very precise location that I can then send to the robot, okay? It's speaking the robot's language, okay, very directly. So, um, so we're, we're doing some very interesting things in that area. And still there's a lot of work to be done. So I, as I said, I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, want anyone to walk away from this going, Gary and his team have solved everything. It's done, <laughs> you know? Uh, there's still so much more to do, to do. We're making a lot of progress. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, we enjoy what we do, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And with that, that's my presentation. So uh, thank you all for your attention um, and everything. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you. Who um, are some of the sponsors of the Ag Tech uh, projects? So, um, the state of Georgia has been um, a key supporter of the work. Uh, then after that, we have funding from USDA. Uh, NSF um, have been funding that work. And then we ha also have a little bit of money coming from industry uh, to fund a little bit of this. 
Um, one of the things I, and some of that work is also in the sensing area, uh, which I didn't really talk about in this, but we also do a lot of work in what we call volatile organic compounds. Um, so it turns out that plants will emit very unique VOCs when they are infected or attacked by a, an insect or a disease. So we're building sensors that can detect those VOCs. And then the robot is in enabling technology that allows you to be able to go sense all of that. But the real, the real crux of that research is in the sensors, developing those and interpreting that data. But that's also been something which has been very, a lot of interest to some of our industry partners. On the uh, poultry side, are there many uh, poultry companies looking, you know, kind of working hand in hand with you all, or is it still a, a, a ways off? So, um, so we, uh, as part of the Agricultural Technology Research Program, we have an advisory committee. Um, so we have 25 companies, and that con constitutes all of the major uh, poultry processing companies, the Tysons, um, uh, Purdue, Fildell, and all these companies, but also the major equipment companies as well. So we have all those on the board. So we, we work with those companies all in different ways. Um, but certainly the processing companies allow us to go to their facilities and do the testing. They supply us with products so we can do the testing in-house so we don't have to go there all the time. And then they help make the connections and, and, and then advocate with, for us uh, to the industry. And then the industry will come in and um, sometimes they'll license the technology. And then sometimes we're actually doing startup companies where we're spinning that off in that route. So the cutting project, we're actually spinning that out to a startup company now uh, with the idea being that if the startup company, what, what we all see now in the startup world, is industries looking for the startup to see if that is successful, then they come in and buy the startup company. That model seems to be uh, the best way to work with industry. Though we, are, we do have some license, direct licensing as well. Question: Regarding the live streaming of the robots. Yes. So, uh, last semester I visited uh, two uh, distribution centers, and they are serving e-commerce uh, market. And one of the level intensive operation is the picking of items. Yes. Yes. Like the items in e-commerce, they comes in uh, multiple sizes, right? So. Everything in the warehouse is almost completely automated, except that that operation, the operation of using people um, picking stuff. Um, would you think that um, this would be like uh, a trend in the future for the warehouse? Oh yes, I mean there's there's lots of work going on in that area, uh, um, especially in the startup community. There's a number of startup companies that are working that e-commerce problem. Um, we actually, at Georgia Tech, uh, within iRealm, the Robotics Institute, we um, won a contest at one of the big conferences. It was the uh, Fetch Robotics had a competition for picking. Um, but yes, it's still very much an open-ended problem. And you see some very creative solutions of companies trying to avoid the grasping problem um, to be able to get around that uh, because it is so difficult. Uh, but yes, there's still a lot, a lot of opportunities uh, to do that. And if you look at most of the companies that are doing that, it's all suction cups. It's, it's usually one suction cup or maybe an array of suction cups that they turn on and off to be able to do that grasping. Because it is so hard. There's such a variety of different objects. So that's a hot area. Yes? Um, do you believe that, like, in the near future that these robots could be used in like either developing countries or like third world countries because um like right now they are very expensive even to do like research on them and like the information that so like i worked for a department of defense contractor for a couple of years and like the thing is that even the things that we we do we're not necessarily like we don't give them to like other people or use the information that we found to other peoples or like even like neighboring countries. So do you feel like in the near future, it will be like a trend where uh, developing countries or third world countries are able to use these kinds of robots or any of the technology or the information that we do with either machine learning, AI 
or robots in general? So I think that you will see that, uh, but I, I don't think it's going to be anything like uh, cell phones, you know, where the developing companies just uh, countries just completely skipped landlines and went straight to cell phones. You know, they were able to leapfrog. And so I don't think you'll see anything like that just because there is such an infrastructure cost. Uh, but I do think that what, what, what we do see, okay, is that when companies build new facilities, they automate, okay? Where are most of the new facilities going? They're going into developing countries and things like this. So what we are seeing is that the, in that sense, the developing countries are getting the latest technology. Okay, so um, you know Vietnam is, is a good example. You know they have a lot of uh, some, uh, and of course China used to be, uh, but I'll stay away from China. But um, you know a lot of technology is going there because they're that's where they're building new plants. Okay, so they'll put technology there, and where the U.S. it's hard to retrofit, so they won't put new technology there. I was in Brazil um, a, a while ago. And, and for looking at poultry. And the, the poultry plants in Brazil had way more automation than the US did, just because they, it was a, a brand new plant. So they built it for automation. So I, I think you see it in that sense. So does that make, did, did I answer your question? Yeah, because even like in the smallest of things, like, like, like for example, like one of the projects that we were working on, like had to do with um, like predicting like arrival and departures of like certain vessels and other things. Yeah. And like these things were like different because like in other countries, military or non-military, they use civilian GPS all the time. Yeah. Unlike here where civilian GPS is just used for civilians and then we have other GPSs that are used for different kinds of things. Yes. And what you see is that even in in these small things that we were coming up with or that we were training all of our data in order to be able to do even these small things were not passed on to like other countries that could so this was like my yes yes so but you did answer it. yeah so the government is completely different than private industry so private industry will distribute that information and so you look at amazon you know they they just slow down all their their warehouse you know there for a while they're building two new distribution centers a week. And those were all over the world. And they had the cutting edge technology in every one of them. So in that sense, you know, Amazon is distributing the technology. The government, DOD, completely different. They don't share. So. Yes? Talk about this unmanaged um, as the work processes start to spread maybe more of enterprise. Is it orchestrated typically from a single point or do you see this behavior being distributed where it's more at a autonomous, even among the mesh? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that a lot of that is kind of TBD. You know, I think right now we're still just in the very early stages of this. So it's being managed much more at the local level. Um, you know, but you are starting to see, um, you know, UPS and other, and other companies doing fleet management. And you could very, they're laying the groundwork so that when they go fully autonomous, they're going to manage that at the corporate level. Okay. Uh, where those vehicles go, the timing and the patterns. So you see, you see companies like that laying the groundwork and that is going to flow down to the warehouses and everything like that so i think you're starting to see that i, I still think we're a long way away you know from that but uh i you know you will start to see that and you'll see the same thing in ag you know um where you know these the the ag robotics they're going to be um sold as a service Okay, and when it's sold as a service, the company managing that is going to start managing that at, at a corporate level. And that's going to be across, you know, all of the valley in California. Okay, it's all going to be managed as one system. Okay, so it will get there. It'll take a while. You know, autonomous systems are still hard. 
you know, I laughed when all the auto companies said they were gonna have autonomous cars by 2020. You know, I thought that was the funniest thing anybody ever said. So, <laughs> you know, we're just, you know, 10 years away, it's hard. So, but yes, it, I do think we'll get there. And when that happens, boy, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's way outside of my area, you know, but that's when I think, you know, people with supply chain, you know, ISYE, you know, systems people are gonna take over and, and start, have to really come to play in that area. What types of systems are used to handle data communications in the agricultural field? Is you set up like LIDAR or is it cellular or what? So um, that, that's actually a big problem. Um, is is the communication in, in rural parts of the country? Um, you know, South Georgia. You know, still there are places where there is no cell phone coverage. So getting data up to the cloud is impossible, and that's why you know there's lots of talk about getting 5G in all kinds of, of places. So you know what you find is you know the farmer has you know they have to do what they have to do. You know, so it turns into collect the data on the tractor, bring it back, upload it you know, to the cloud at the end so you don't get quite the real-time you know, control. And the cloud is where they're doing a lot of the, the data analysis. And there's a lot of companies that are providing services okay, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, now there's an incredible amount of issues of, of privacy and data rights that go into that. Um, so just a simple story is, I was talking to a farmer. He was leasing the land from somebody. And he started putting up on his website about all his increase in yields because he was doing all this precision ag. He was, you know, monitoring the water. You know, he wasn't just doing the, the center pivots. He, you know, had drip lines and he was, you know, had sensors and he was, you know, reduced his water usage by 50%, but the yields were going up and it was, and he put that on the website. Well, the guy who was leasing the land saw how much more he was making, jacked up his rates, okay? So that's just one example, but there's all kinds of, of issues with privacy when it goes up into the cloud and comparing your field versus somebody else's field and stuff. But, you know, to really to benefit from these services, you gotta get it to the cloud. And that does become a problem. And, uh, you know, and plus everybody needs differential GPS. Um, when they, you know, because they're, they're GPS tagging every plant location. So when you plant a seed, you know exactly where that is, and you need differential GPS to do that. You know, it's another expense that they have to, to pay for. So, oh, in the back. Great presentation. Uh, I had a quick question with regards to, you mentioned privacy and uh, data. Can you speak to about some of the large manufacturers and their uh, control of the like John Deere, for example. They seem to believe it's very hard for many farmers to actually repair their vehicles unilaterally like they used to. <laughs> Have you guys been getting any so, <laughs> questions or? Yeah, uh, so, so the question is, um, uh, some of the bigger companies, their data use and also their right to repair. Um, I think this is the same problem Apple has had. Okay, and so the problem is uh, farmers are traditionally, um, you know, they're, they're Mr. Fix-It. They're Mr. Self-Sustainable, you know. They don't want to call anybody. They want to fix everything themselves. So the, the history is they, they worked on their own tractors. They fixed their tractors. They modified them, you know, and um, they improved things. And that was all well and good until we started getting more sophisticated technology in, in the field. And now John Deere and some of the other companies have said, um, you cannot fix our autonomous tractor. You cannot fix our, um, our, our sears and our fertilizer sprays because we have all these sensors and all these um, um, mechanisms on them. Um, just recently, I think in the past month or so, John Deere has changed its stance and has, has said, we will allow people to be able to, to repair and maintain their own equipment, okay? Now I don't, I'm, I'm sure the devil's in the details in that and I've not read, you know, 
the details of that, but there has been some movement in that area. Thank you again, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.